And uh, today is, uh, as you see here, acquiring languages without subject or object. What does that mean? Well, Michael's going to tell you what it means. Yeah, you know, I just put up that title just to mess with your guys' heads, right? <laughs> because uh, I might get interest from a few people who would like a challenge, which I'm going to try and challenge you guys today. I know all of you are very intelligent. You've been learning many um, very, what you could call very divergent languages and different systems. So I want to try to kind of a present a challenge today. Um, we can't say that the language doesn't actually have... Uh, not have subjects or objects. That's not entirely true. Um, but th it does work in a different paradigm. And a lot of languages do work like this. Okay, so um, a little bit about myself. I have lived in Taiwan most of my life. Taiwan uh, is a small island just south of Japan. And it has a very long history, about 7,000 years of uh, the Formosan indigenous populations there. Uh, I acquired uh, some of the... Uh, the languages, including the Chinese languages of Taiwan, but uh, also in the last 10 years, uh, more and more of the Formosan languages. So as you can see, some of my interests are all things linguistic related to languages. Uh, and I also developed uh, the platform Glossica that helps people learn languages. Okay, so we're gonna talk about four things. Uh, indigenous languages and language vitality. Uh, which is kind of an interesting topic all by itself. We don't have much time for that, but uh, accusativity and, uh, versus ergativity. Okay, so uh, the title of my, of my speech is Languages Without Subject and Object, but that's actually getting into this topic, accusativity versus ergativity. Um, Taiwan, uh, the names we use uh, in Taiwan, and then the Form Formosan languages. Uh, these are different than Sinitic or Chinese languages, by the way. And then a study of alignment in Paiwan language. So alignment... I'm not going to go into what that means right now, if you've never heard of that, but I want to I allow all of you to experience uh, the, the, the structure of this Aborigine language uh, with uh, native speakers that I've brought with me today. Uh, okay, so let's first talk about indigenous languages in general. A lot of people have a misconception that languages that have fewer than a thousand people must be endangered. This is not entirely true, because all throughout history, languages have always had a small number of spe speakers, and only until the recent years have, has the human population grown to so much that we have languages with millions or even billions of speakers. So uh, don't always think of, of a small language as being something that is endangered. Um, how can we determine if a language is actually endangered? The one thing that I like to look at is what do 16-year-olds speak with each other? Because you have a lot of face involved with this, social pressure, peer pressure, if they're proud of the way they speak, they're going to use that language between each other. But if they're embarrassed by it, they'll probably switch to a more dominant language. Um, but you'll see this happening in Taiwan. A lot of languages now, um, people understand their parents' languages, but they're switching between each other, uh, they'll switch to a more dominant language, like Mandarin Chinese. I often see journalists writing that a language dies every two weeks, and I kind of uh, have a problem with this because I, when I ask them for the names of the list of languages, they're never able to give me that. They just keep repeating what another journalist has said. Um, so I'm going to show you the proof that I found today. And I also have uh, something outside at our booth that you can check. So here's a list of extinct languages since 2011. And the little three-letter code after each language name is the ISO uh, language code. So we have Lower Southern Aranda. Does anybody know where that language might be spoken? Yes, Australia. Holy Kachuk. Take a guess. Where is it spoken? No? Yes. I don't know if you're right or wrong, but I'll take it as a possibility. Okay, Wasco Wishram. Wasco Wishram. Um, probably also North America. Dungalu. I think we can guess Australia. Okay. Yurok. California. Yeah, I think. In, yeah, and then live. I'm not sure if that's Livonian, because that would be Estonia, right? Or Latvia. Um, Klalem. Now, Klalem, I've, I've put this, this one is also North America, a North American indigenous language. We've marked it as reawakening. We've color labeled all of these language names. And so that means that there's actually a group of people that are working hard on trying to bring the language back to life. There are people who speak the language, but they're not born as native speakers. 
Okay, so the next one, Tai Ban or Tai Ban or Thai Ban. <laughs> Not sure about the. Uh, actually, I don't know where that one is spoken. Wichita, Wichita. Where do you think is spoken? It's in the U.S. It's in the U.S. I think that's correct. Mandan. I know this one. I think this one is in North Dakota in the U.S. And the last one, Thao. Thao is actually a language that I speak. It's spoken in central Taiwan at Sun Moon Lake. Uh, I took a government proficiency test on that one uh, a few years ago. Uh, I started working on the Thao language in 2009, and in 2017, the last native speaker passed away. Um, my, my teacher and his wife passed away a few months later in May, but they were 94 years old. So it was, we expected that this would happen soon, um, but we, a lot of people have been making visits to the, the, the eldest elders, learning the language, documenting the language, so we have a, a, a huge amount of material in the language, stories and all kinds of things in Thao. And apparently Thao, according to some researchers, ethnographic research, research in the United, I'm, I'm sorry, in, the, in Taiwan, in the central area, they, they found that the language has been there for um, thousands of years due to migration, you know, and things that they've been able to dig up. So all of this research comes from ISO, Glottolog and Ethnolog. Now, the ISO website consistently updates their site on the three-letter codes and, and whatnot, and then you can get a lot of the, um, the vitality information from Ethnolog. So on the chart outside, I have every single language in the world listed on that chart and colored, coded for its vitality. And you'll notice that English speakers tend to report a lot in the... Uh, in it, the journalists tend to report that there's a lot of languages dying, but you'll notice that all the red sections of this chart consist of the U.S. and Australia. So most of language death is happening in the U.S. and Australia, where English is a dominant language. However, we don't see that in Africa, which is in the top half, top third of this chart, and in the central part you have a lot of the Austronesian languages. Austronesian makes up about a, a 1,275 languages. And so you can download that, e that poster for free from my website. Um, if you'd like to order the poster, you can come talk to us. We'll figure something out for that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the QR code again at the end of the speech, okay? So right now, 167 world languages were added since 2013. 38 languages are new discoveries. So despite language death, we're actually the number of languages in the world is actually increasing year by year, which is kind of interesting, despite what they're reporting. Now this one is without color because it's sort of an unattested language. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, the other languages out of that 167 were the, either dialect upgrades because, for example, Western Armenian, there's a, an Armenian diaspora in other countries, they've now upgraded the language to a language status because it's, it's somewhat unintelligible to Eastern Armenian, so they now have their own ISO code. Okay, so... Today I'm going to be talking about subject-object versus absolutive ergative. Let's just take a very simple example of a door. A door is a piece of wood that doesn't do anything. No matter what it does or what happens to it, it's just always a theme. It's an absolutive thing. It's just absolutely a door. It's never going to do anything, right? It's, it's dead, right? So whether the door is open or I open the door, why do I have to change anything about the concept of this door? Why do I have to change it into an accusative case, you know? As, you know, this is us forcing our subject-object paradigm onto real-world events, which I think is kind of silly, because the door never changes. It's just, it's always itself. It's always an outside force that is changing, changing that door. So no matter what we do in any of our sentences, and I've color-coded the, the theme in these sentences as red, and we'll, I'll continue to do that through the rest of today's speech. So the door was opened by me. Uh, it was me who opened the door. I opened the door, I made the door open. In all of those cases, the ergative agent is the I, or the me, okay? So no matter how I color code all of that in those sentences, what I'm extracting is, what is the meaning that I'm trying to express here? But not rather, rather than, what word order am I trying to use? So European languages tend to focus on, oh, what word am I gonna say first, and then I'm gonna attach all this grammar to it, okay? But in actuality, the concept that we're describing is an open door, okay? Ergativity in English. 
Um, for example, the presentation is starting, and I'm starting the presentation. In one case, it's a nominative. In the other case, it's accusative. Why is that necessarily? Oh, why, why is that necessary? We can also say the presentation is being started by me. These clothes wash easily. One can easily wash these clothes. The clothes don't do anything, right? So why does the verb, even if you're speaking a European language, why does this verb have to conjugate according to the clothes? And in European languages, of course, you would need to use some sort of a, a reflexive. The food is cooking versus I'm cooking the food. I've never seen a piece of food, food stand in the kitchen and cook. Oh. But if you think about it, somebody who speaks an ergative language coming over to learn English is going to really have trouble understanding this. Although in Chinese, Chinese has the exact same ambiguity as English does. So in Chinese, it's perfectly normal to say the food is cooking. Okay. So in, in languages that mark their grammar, for example, these indigenous languages, this would be kind of a, a weird concept. You'd have to change things around to make it make sense. Okay, so what is anti-passive? Anti-passive is basically this one where the presentation is starting. You're not saying who is doing it. So you're, you're lacking, the, the, you're lacking the, the passive part of that thing. So linguists call it anti-passive. There's all kinds of other kinds of uh, anti this and that, but let's keep it simple. Okay, so complexity in subject object languages. If we take a look across European and maybe Asian languages, we'll find that um, the different way to express the same thing across languages takes different tenses and, and cases. So I like this book, Nienravica et Kniga. Et Kniga is still in the nominative case. Dieses Buch gefällt mir. And so even the position of the words in the sentence tend to, tend to um, vary. Uh, I miss you. Tu me manque? Anataga inaikte sabichides? And they have the same syntactic roles. There is an experiencer in these sentences. So you have nie, mir, me, and I in the English. And, all, and then the Japanese is actually missing the I because I don't need to actually state it. It's, it's understood by the context. But your theme here, the English is accusative, if we still marked accusative, right? And in the Japanese, though, it's a ga. Because the theme in Japanese usually shows up as ga. And the ergative agent in Japanese usually shows up as a wa, right? And that, that also translates over into Korean as well. An accident happened. Again, here, avaria is not avariyu. That would make it accusative. But something happening is not necessarily accusative. But Russians will always say avaria after the verb, the same way that the Chinese say fa shang le huo after the verb. Actually, this might be incorrect, me saying that che huo is, is an object. Che huo might actually be a subject. But the Chinese always place it after the verb, even though Chinese is a subject verb object language. This kind of a sentence is an existential sentence. In Chinese, you always start an existential sentence with yo, meaning have, have existing, OK? So if we look at how we um, analyze languages syntactically at Glossika, the, the underlying engine for, for analyzing languages, we put determinant roles on all of the grammar. So actions with agents that do not take objects, like running and swimming and flying. Agents with committative means you're doing it with somebody. In fact, the committative, in most of these cases, like for example, if I, if I go somewhere with my friend, in English we put this... Um, we put this at the end of the sentence. Uh, and we would think that with my friend is sort of the object of this prepositional phrase. But if you translate into Russian, you'd say, uh, we, we, we with the friend. And then you would say, you know, wherever you're going. So in Russian, they will actually place that before the verb, but the main pronoun would be a we. So that's kind of an interesting uh, variant there. So agent plus theme is where you have this, this action verb, but you also have what we call a light object, um, light as in it's not a heavy object, so capture, chase, hunt, and uh, all of those things. Okay, so the existential, the one I just mentioned on the last slide, is something that exists. So if something exists, it's neither a subject nor object, and it's just kind of weird how European languages need to put a label on that, like this is either a subject or this is either an object or whatever. I think in most languages they're going to mark it as nominative. But you have, um, it would be interesting to look at Hungarian and how they mark it. And I haven't done that yet, but that's, that would be an interesting case. But you also have a causative agent where 
you add the ergative element to it. So you create, destroy, or consume. OK, so the third kind of verb class that we classify are stative verbs. And we're going to talk a lot more about these today. So things like cost, or be big, or be small, be predicate. You know, if you, you know in Spanish, they have two verbs for be, which is estar, um, sorry, estar and um, ser, right? So if things are inherently, inherently a certain way, in Spanish, that's the first line there, so ser. You know, if something is big or small, it's just always like that, right? But if you're acting a certain way, and in English we use the same kind of verb form, but we use it in the present tense. For example, you're being naughty. Well, in Spanish you would use the estar form because that's just a behavioral thing that's, that's happening uh, at this time. So um, that would be the active state, agent plus theme. Okay, so feeling state, experiencer plus theme, you'll notice that in languages like Russian and German, you're going to get the date of case uh, because it's something that you experience that comes back to me from your outside. So, for example, if you say I'm tired or I'm hurt or I got hurt, these things that you experience, they come towards to your, to your body from the outside. So if, you, if I say this, um, the presentation speaker is boring, it's coming from him. He's being an agent of, of causing other people boredom, and I'm really sorry for that. But if you... If, if I say I'm bored, it's because I'm experiencing it from an outside place. So in English, it's quite clear about that. We, we'll add the ed and ing endings. And if the adjective doesn't have an ing ending, we'll just use y. So for example, scary. Something is scary, I experience it. OK, so the intersocial. Intersocial are verbs that actually uh, connect with another person. OK, so that's pretty, pretty easy to understand. And most, uh, you know, like German and, and, and the Slavic languages, they're going to mark those as date of case. And so you can pretty much um, predict all of the date of case verbs in, in languages like German. So the causative agent plus theme plus state. Hit, frighten, open, feed. So open the door. You have the theme is the door. The agent who is doing it is, you know, I. I open the door. Because what you're actually doing is you're changing the state of the door. You're changing the, the door's state from an open position to a closed position. So it's interesting in English where we say, I close the door, and then I add the final state at the end of the sentence. I say, I close the door shut. And then English speakers will actually move that up and make it into a new verb, which it originally wasn't in English. I shut the door. They use the final state as a new kind of a verb form. You'll notice that English speakers do this over time. They start moving things as a final state into the verb position where it never was a verb before. So the complex ergative agent, make, tell, have somebody do something. So this is more of it where you're adding valency onto the verb and creating more, uh, more people doing things in the sentence. OK, so patterns across languages. So because we analyze languages in this way, we're able to kind of predict the patterns in different languages. For example, the case governance in German, I just mentioned, reflexive verbs across European languages. Um, wa versus ga, or ka versus in in Japanese and Korean. Difference in ergativity in Georgian and Basque. Just to give you a quick example here, in, if I go back here, the actions up here of running and swimming and, and all of the, everything is ergative in Basque, but in Georgian, these are not ergative. In, in Georgian, only the causative, the causative sentences are ergative. So that's why they call Georgian a what is it, a half ergative language or something like this, is only one, of, one or two of these uh, cases actually become, take an ergative agent. Okay, so Austronesian alignment and ergativity can also be predicted, light verbs and serial verb constructions that you find in many of the um, Asian and American languages. Okay, so let's talk about Austronesian languages. In Austronesia, they cover a very large area of the world, and they kind of originate from Taiwan, and we know that because um, Taiwan as Urheimat has the most diversity of all of the all of the Austronesian languages and there's only one language within Taiwan territory that belongs to the Malayo Polynesian group and that's on the Bel Tobago Island called Dao. So 1275 Austronesian languages you can see it on the chart outside the uh, conference hall and many of these do not have accusative alignment that means they don't use nominative accusative they don't use subject and object the way we think of it. Formosan languages, we call them Formosan. Uh, you may know the, the history of Taiwan. Was one, Taiwan was once called Formosa from the Portuguese word. Um, but we now borrow that word to describe the indigenous languages of Taiwan as a branch within Austronesian languages. So out of these, you get Sedek, Tso, Amis, Atayan, 
Punun Taiwan, Rukai, Shai Shiat, Pima, or Pini Yumayan, Slaalua, Kanakanavu, Kabalan, or Kabalan, Baze, and the Kahabu dialect is still spoken. I know native speakers of that, Saki Zaya. This is a dead language from the, east, from the west coast, Babuza Siraya. There are a group of people trying to bring the language back to life. And Thao, which, I've, which I mentioned before I speak, uh, Basai, Katagalan, and Papora. Turuku is also spoken in Taiwan, but it doesn't have its own ISO code. All right, so to give you a little story, uh, a woman who lived in Japan, who, uh, she applied to go teach English in Taiwan in 1915 or 16. She came to Taiwan in 1916, a little over 100 years ago. She lived there for two years, and she's actually, uh, she studied basically what you call matriarchal societies. And she was really curious about this thing that Taiwan had this, um, this legend of matriarchal society. So she had to come to Taiwan and, and check it out. So she took the ship down to, um, to, to Taiwan, and she, I have the book that she published in 1922 right here. And in this book, you'll find pictures, the only pictures that we have of an ancient pygmy race um, that has since died out. Um, those pygmy, pygmies are called Akta people in the northern Philippines. You can still find them, but they, they look more like Papuan, uh, uh, the way they look. So here is the book, Janet McGovern in Taiwan from 1916 to 1918. And her writing style is very much like modern blogs. It's just kind of like a diary. Oh, this is what happened to me. It's a really fun read, and I recommend uh, if you want to get the book, you can talk to us afterwards. William McGovern is her son, who then became the inspiration for Indiana Jones. And he traveled, he studied in Kyoto. He, he was brought up bilingual in Japanese. He learned to read Chinese. He became the, one of the key interpreters for the US military in World War II um, and whatnot. So he actually came to Taiwan and traveled with his mother to visit the uh, Aborigines at the time. But many people don't know that actually he was the inspiration for the later movie that came out later. The history of Taiwan's name. Let's talk about regular sound changes. We all know that G becomes Y or W, as you can see, between Germanic and, and English. Um, so if we take the, the word like Tagal, meaning person, becomes Tag, Tao, Tai, or Tao. And we add the place, the living place of people, that's Ketagal An. Ketagal An. So An is the place. So the names of tribes, like Ketagal An, and then the, you have the glottal stop, Atayan. The L at the end of the word is pronounced like an N, or a mix of LN, so Atayan. Tao, Zhou, Tao, Taiwan, and Kavalan. I'm not sure about the last one, but the Kavalan name might actually be related where the T has become a K. Okay, so the Siraya name, Dao, An, has later become the name of Taiwan as Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is the southern Min or Taiwanese pronunciation of Taiwan. And when it gets translated into Mandarin, we add the aspiration, T. So it's actually originally Ta. Taiwan. And you can see names of places in Taiwan, like Taoyuan Ji Chang, the, the airport that you fly into, in, into Taiwan, and close by Taoyuan. These places also have remnants of that same root. So you can see that Tagalan becomes Taiwan and Taiwan. Okay, so here is a map that we made in our company a few years ago. It shows all of the locations of the languages. And so, including the 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 Sinitic languages of Chinese, but Paiwan is located at the bottom here. And if you go all the way down to the, to the southern coast, you get pockets of Ami speakers, but north of that are all the Paiwan speakers. So today I would like to invite onto stage um, two friends of mine. Yeah, this is how I travel around Taiwan on this bike. This bike allows me to get in pretty much anywhere within seven hours, which is a, a time saver, as long as I do it safely. <laughs> Um, but uh, recently I attended the festival, the Spirits Festival in Kulalao, and as you can see here, we have, they make all of their own clothing. So all of it's handmade uh, within, their, uh, within their own tribes. And so he's wearing a real skin um, clothing here. And we have uh, dancing festivals. You notice that the hats, the headpieces that they're wearing are from animals. Here is a two members of the royalty. So Paiwan is known as a matriarchal society. They have royalty, or guizu, and the royalty, they have feathers in their headpieces. And here you can see one of the chieftains walking down the street, getting ready for a major ceremony. 
uh, and then one of the junior uh, helpers helping out with the children and all that within the tribe. And I took all of these pictures last weekend in person. But I'm not going to show you the selfies because that's kind of silly. Okay, so Kulelao Spirits Festival. And you, as you can see, they have all of these uh, customs and traditions. And so all of these festivals, they happen throughout the year, and they're, they're doing different things and according to their customs and traditions. And it's, it's quite complicated, um, but the, the society has been there for thousands of years, and this is a very, very well-developed. There's a lot of taboos, things you are allowed to do and things you're not allowed to do, things you can say and you cannot say, a lot of rules for everything. In fact, the, the Paiwan tribe is very strict about all of their activities and things that you can do and not do. So when I show up, uh, you know, sometimes you see foreigners or white people kind of getting in there wanting to dance with people, and I would suggest never do that. Stand off to the side, allow people to do their things the way they're supposed to be done. Don't get into the pictures, you know, don't interfere with their customs and traditions because there's a lot of taboos. If you want to take pictures, stand off to the side or do it at a distance, and don't disrupt um, their traditions. Um, I would like to invite up on the stage Lavu Lavu and Sag Sagubi. So in the last half of our talk today, we're going to be practicing, and this is going to be um, interactive. We're going to be practicing the Paiwan language. Now Paiwan is with a P. Okay, so as you can see in southern Taiwan, this map shows the dialectal areas of, of the Paiwan language, and there are quite a few dialects. Now, the dialect differences are mostly due to intonation, for example, the different stress of the language. Um, and some of that's kind of complex because there's been a lot of migrations over the years. Um, but Kula Lao, if I point up here, oh, nice. Job. That star right there, that's Kula Lao. And so there's a Chinese name, there's a Chinese name, a translation is uh, Gulo, uh, or the whole area is called Lai Yi. And then this is the northern area of the uh, Paiwan area. Now th these are from actual research on the, the, the dialects of Paiwan. So as you can see, within each language, there's a lot of dialectal variation. So we're gonna start understanding um, some basic Paiwan sentences. And I would like everybody to read along. Okay, so the first word is to close. Notice I'm using a causative state here, okay? So um, we're going to start uh Okay, so read together with us, okay? Everybody. Okay, now when, okay, so when we, sorry, I need to code switch here. Okay, so back to English. So, 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 uh, okay, so the next word, we're going to add a su at the beginning of the word, and that's an opposite or undoing this action. Okay, so... So, Okay, so... Good. And we add si as a prefix and an as a location, and we get the tool for which you do it, or the thing that is, is undergoing that action. So, man, zama shu? Okay, so let's put words together. When we say close a door, this is not a, an actual complete sentence yet. So we're, we're still going to be adding gram, grammatical particles. So you might hear her adding things already that are not written in there. Okay, so we're still adding pieces. Okay, so open a door. Okay, so now we're going to describe states. When we describe states, remember, we, we just talked about the experience or state, and something that you experience comes towards you. So when you undergo that state, you get or become that state. So we add a ma at the beginning of the word, and you'll find a lot of words in Austronesian languages that add this ma at the beginning. So in this case, we have to guanza, be closed. Makalav. Makalav. And op be opened. Masukalav. 
So now we're going to describe putting the things together. We're going to add some particles in here. So a connects uh, to the to the theme. Okay, 那个门是关起来的状态。马格勒阿朱瓦西格勒万，马格勒阿朱瓦西格勒万。Okay, 那那是关的门。Okay. No, I'm gonna say because the door is open. So we're gonna do the same thing that we just did, but we're gonna change the open and close, changing it to open. Okay. So now, now, we're just using the door. Okay. 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 Oh, this is masukalu azua. Masukalu azua shikalavan. Okay. Masukalu azua shikalavan. 好，那我们现在后面加那个手势教教练。手势教练。现在加。Masukalu masukalu a shikalavan. 嗯。Masukalu a shikalavan. 对，我们是开的门，所以 masukalu a。嗯。Okay, so the next one we're going to be doing the uh, so we're going to do the agent focus. So just to describe real quick is that if your sentence, if your verb, is unmarked without any uh, affixes, then we're going to use a as a connecting word to the thing that connects to the verb. It's sort of like agreement in European languages. And the patient, the one that undergoes, like the accusative, the one that undergoes that action is dua. And this is indefinite. And if you want to change it to definite, you're going to say da zua. Because du zua itself means that thing, or that. Okay, so da zua. And then just to describe real quick, when we add un at the end of a verb, this is the patient focus, and so we're going to connect it with an a. So whatever has the a connector is going to connect is going to agree with this verb with un. So the verb prefix, the verb we're now we're going to add a prefix onto the verb, and that is the ergative agent. So originally, I might have the word "I do it" after the verb in an unmarked verb, but now when it becomes marked and it agrees with something else in the sentence, I have to move my "I" to the beginning of the verb, and it becomes part of the same word. Okay, so that might be a little bit confusing, but we'll practice it in just a second. And then again, "a" and "azua," and then "na" and then "nazua." As the agents and definite agents, I know that's a little bit confusing, but we'll practice it. All right. Okay. So the finally, the last one is the um, not patient focus. This is actually the location focus. That's a, a typo there. So we mark the verb with an an, and the location focus can be connected with an e. Now this e usually connects to a thing in a location. Okay. But if we're going to be connecting to a person or other things, we might use a different particle. So again, a、uh, and azua are the are the patients. E is the location, and e you can actually connect with e zua as well. So with telicity, which means the、um, completedness of the verb, if we infix an um into the verb, it means it's undergoing that action currently. And if it changes to in, it's already done. And you'll find the same thing happening in languages like Tagalog, where you have um and in. Okay, so the patient location focus reduplicated also means doing. So actually, we cannot use the um infix if the verb is in a different focus. We have to use a reduplicated form of the verb. So, like in Tagalog, you might say "magta trabaho." You reduplicate the beginning of that、um, "trabaho" verb. Patient locus,、uh, location focus unmarked is is done. So it's a completed action. Okay, so we're going to talk about the causative states. In this sentence, we're going to say something is being closed. It is closing. We use we always start with the verb in most cases, and then a man, the door. So as you can see, the the man is marked as the ergative agent using a because a now agrees with the verb. 好，那我们就就说，呃，那个呃，这个呃，一个一个人把那个门关起来，正在关起来。Okay, everybody, try it. Now we're going to change the verb so that it is focused on. Here we're using the patient focus, so the ah agreement is now with 
the verb. Okay, so it's kind of like focusing on the door. It's the door that is that was closed by the man. So now the man goes into this um, oblique case. Okay. Okay, everybody try that. Okay, so in the next one, let's try another sentence here. And then I close the door. Here we're adding that particle to the beginning of the verb. Gu means I. Okay. Gu. Okay, let's practice a few more sentences. Pavai to give, and then alap to take. We reduplicate it as alalap, alalap, and then to steal, zakao. So these can change into their other case, in their other forms. Pinavai, pavayan, pavayan, sorry, and pavayan, inalap, alalapan, alalapan. Tinakao, tsakavan, and tinakavan. And then paisu and uma. You can see the, the meanings there. Okay, so I gave money. Woman di ju. Binavai akan dua paisu. Okay, everybody. Binavai akan dua paisu. Okay, the Nigerian gave the chen. Okay, the man gave me the money. Gave me money. It's indefinite. Okay. I gave the man money. And I'm giving you money. So here we're going to we're going to insert the you right after the gu. So it's gu su. So the su means you, and it's also inserted inside of that first verb, first word. Yeah. Gu su pa vain da pai su. And so this is actually currently giving. Okay, so in the oblique, in the oblique focus, we're using na. So I took the man's money. Now what I'm doing field. Uh, when I'm doing, you know, collecting data in the field and I'm asking her for data, she's going to say, I'm going to ask her, can I say this sentence? Is this possible? And she says, no, this is, this is really weird. This is not. You don't want to say, you, you say you're you going to change it to a pronoun, ni maju. Okay, and if we're doing it currently, we're gonna we're going to uh, reduplicate the internal verb there. Mm. Great. Okay, so with location, I took money from the man. Actually, woman, uh, woman, um, because otherwise it would be okay. Let's just do it like this. I'm taking money from the man. Sorry, I wrote in the past. Okay, so I'm taking money from the man. So here we change the, the E particle to a gasi, meaning it's coming from, okay? But it still undergoes that, that location focus. So the man stole my money from my house, huh? Sinakavan. Sinakavan. Okay, 
，是呢，加万阿古白薯，一古朱马，那朱瓦草草。So as you can see in each sentence, the person that is doing the action is kind of hard to figure it out unless you understand the as and the nas that connect with that verb. Okay, so who who understands everything completely clear so far? Raise your hand. Stu J has got it. Oh, we got two. I speak an ergative language. You speak an ergative language. Excellent. <laughs> My plan today was just to completely confuse you guys, and I think I have accomplished that. Okay. Okay. So um, another thing that you'll notice here is that there's a TJ added onto the umak. So this is an, so another kind of an oblique particle. We're not going to go into that, but that's how it's supposed to be said correctly. Okay. So which is more normal, the kasi or the tsu? Okay, we have a question. No, because here, here you can say kasi kutsumak. Kasi kutsumak. But but it's but the location is at the house, so i kutsumak is also the money was stolen at my house. So it doesn't matter if you say the money was stolen at my house or from my house. It's the same meaning. In fact, in here, you know, they might think of it in their in their way of thinking is that it happened at my house rather than. The money was from my house because then it sounds like it's like a, a part, a partitive of it. So zu on that is like zai. No, this zu, this zumak is actually just a particle that adds onto. Yeah, there's actually a pronoun article like za, um, for example, za nu, za nu, uh, za zua, za zua, and za, and so this za can also appear on a lot of nouns as well. Yeah, but it's kind of beyond today's talk. So the next one is uh, oblique na. I'm taking the man's money. Oh wait, wait. I, okay. I think they can read. Okay, 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 so let's everybody go to because we're running out of time. Let's go. Ku a la la ben a bai su na zu a zao zao. Okay, and then I took money from the table. Zakui, Zakui's table. Okay, so okay, you guys try it. Ku a la ben bai su yi da zi gui. 听得懂吗？听得懂。有没有有没有感动？好厉害哦！有没有感动？有有。把全部的人都都在念台湾话 ，OK，OK，、okay. okay. and that's the end of our talk today. <laughs> She feels very moved by by this experience. So、um, you can download the language vitality ebook there.、Um, quick, real quick, questions? Just okay. A question and maybe a comment. Yeah, Hungarian was pr probably interesting when you were、uh, talking about the object because、uh, they've got the double conjugation, objective and uh, subjective, uh, if the object is determined or not. And they've got. It's interesting to notice that in Finnish also they've got use of the object in partitive or in accusative, according that the object is definite or not. And I see that in Latvian, there's a strong influence of the Finno-Greek language. And I believe the the semi-accusative structure in Russian is coming from these Finno-Greek languages. Yeah. So I, I think it's、mm. it's not clear that it's really the case to be normal for a Slavic language. This structure、oh, okay. in Russian. Okay. It's probably coming from, from, from Finno Greek. In my But you know, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I get the feeling like when we jump to other language families, whether that's Bantu or that's、uh, Finno Ugric or Hungarian, I feel like you know,、uh, people are scared of these things. I, I, and really, don't be scared of things like Hungarian or Finnish、yeah. because I think that there's alignment in there that you just need to adjust your operating system. As,、uh, just borrowing a word from Stuja here. Uh, you my, just my, my name、system. is Gonzalo. In Latvian, it's Mani Sals Gonzalo. It is like Minya Ravitsa, Minya Zavut、okay. Gonzalo in Russian.、So. Yeah,、it's, and I think that if you adjust your operating system, you look at the world in a different way.、Uh, in what's happening, it really helps to be able to express yourself correctly. Okay. Any other questions?、Oh, and also questions for our our visitors today. Yes, Stuja. How mutually intelligible are These languages throughout Taiwan, because like if you speak Tagalog, there are many, or Indonesian, there are many words you will recognize here. Can they understand each other?、Um, I will. I will read sentences out loud that were taken from Southern Paiwan di dialect、um, for Lavu Lavu here, and she won't understand what I'm saying. And she said, "Wait, are you? Is that Southern Pai?" And she, show me that word. And, and and then she says, "Oh, we don't even use that word." 
And so I think that even between the dialects, it's hard for them to understand each other. And it's not a written language. As you can see, it's really, it takes a lot of time to process what's written there and then turn that back into speech. So I'm usually cueing her with the Chinese first so that she can reconstruct what, what we're saying. So it's not a written language. Um, these things are just things they do naturally. Um, so when it, of course, we as linguist, linguists, we can see those, um, those roots across languages, but most people, they cannot, they, they don't have that, that sense there. So even within the dialects, it's, there's a, some uh, communication issues. You don't even need to mention across languages. Even the neighboring languages are completely unintelligible. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I think I've asked you this question before in an email. Uh, okay. Which is that might have been a long response, though. I love uh, it writing was long very, emails. It a long <laughs> response. It took me uh, a while to get through the whole thing, but it was a very good one, uh, and this talk was as well. But with these languages, we all care about protecting and preserving these languages. But the problem is, we we like protecting languages. But the problem is, it's like it's hard to learn. It's not really these online resources. So like, how would we, if we wanted to learn these languages, how could we learn them? <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing is, is that, yeah, of course, I mean, I'm working with uh, some of the Paiwan members to, to um, digitize the language, but I don't know if that's something we'll actually put into Glossika because we need to get permissions from tribal, uh, you know, and a lot of people, when the languages get smaller and smaller and smaller, people feel like they have ownership of that. Like, oh, you can't take our language and publish a dictionary. That's our stuff. You know, are you paying us a copyright? Even if you, you give it out for free, you know, people are concerned about that. And so you have to respect uh, the tribes that you work with. You can't claim ownership over these things because a small group of people, every person in the world who speaks that language says, this is mine. Who do you have the right to take it? Even if I learn the language, it's theirs, you know? So when a language has a million speakers, you can't get everybody's agreement on that. You know, it, now it's just, it's public knowledge. Uh, 就是关于资源跟难度学，你想要呃可以发音。嗯，其实那个那个原住民族献唱词典也有啦。So uh, there there is something made by the Taiwan government. You have a website um, from the Indigenous Affairs Commission, and they have online dictionaries that you can download and and access and learn from. You just have have to be really really mindful of lots of spelling errors because it's in early days of putting things into writing. And all the dialects have different spelling uh, conventions. So you'll find, in, in even in from one sentence to the next, like the word, the same word will ha be spelled in two different ways because they had two different people from two different dialects. And you know, the language has to go through a period of standardization. They didn't put this into writing until you know, at most 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm very long. Do you have anything else? Uh, if you live in Taiwan, now the government actually um, have a, um, just passed the Taiwan Indigenous Language Act, so you can learn all the indigenous language in, in the elementary school from university. You can take as a credit, extra credit. And, uh, and also we have language certification. You can, you can learn, and there's a, there's a call language paradise, Zuyu Yi Le Yuan, it's on website, but it's all in Chinese, and yeah. Right, right now the issue is that you need to know Chinese to, in order to access these materials, and of course reading Chinese is a big challenge to begin with, uh, and I find some of the translations are overly, um, 字典里面很多文言的那个中文的翻译，我觉得对外国人来说说是很难开始学。They they have a lot of very literary uh, translations of things that might be a challenge for foreigners if you're learning Chinese still. Yeah, but I think that because it's a romanized way of spelling, you can't really put this to characters anyway. You can prop there should be a way that we can make the jump from English to Paiwan, and we're, we've been discussing that. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Is it Sarah? Okay, Sarah. Um, yeah, so I have a question about the beginning of your talk. You mentioned a stat, a stat about the number of languages that are being discovered, so new languages. And I'm just really curious. Um, I understand how that works with sign languages, because I've done a lot of sign language research. But how does that work with spoken languages, given that usually they're constantly changing you know, along a gradient? When do you decide that it's become a new language? 
Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a real life example of this in the last few years. Um, the number of languages spoken within the Chinese border in mainland China has increased significantly in recent years. And the reason for this is that when you go into the mountainous areas of Yunnan, which is along the border of um, you know, Myanmar and Thailand, in the southern, you know, there, there are a, a very large diversity of, of ethnic groups in there. So when they go in there and they start researching the, um, the, the Na and the Isul Na languages in that group, we had an idea that there's like, there's like 10 languages in there, right? And so these people, they go in, they record stories from one tribe, like, tell us all your stories. And then they take that recording to the next tribe and they, tell, and they ask them, I'm going to play a story in your language. I want you to tell me what it means. And if the, the elders are like, Shh, they're talking in a weird, I don't understand half of what they're saying, then we know this is a different language. And that's something that they hadn't figured out before because they have the dictionaries and they have the grammars written out. And so they're still kind of confused, you know. But when they actually take the recordings and go to the next village and tell me, what does this mean? You know, and there's some prejudices there, but they, wor they work it out. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Thank you.